So welcome to today's webinar on driving appraisal and assessments for older drivers. My name is Rob Hurd. I'm the chair and founder of the Older Drivers Forum and will be the chair of this meeting and webinar today. I'm a retired police officer after 30 years service, 27 of those as a roads policing officer and in charge of road safety for Hampshire and Thames Valley uh, in my latter years before retirement. So I've got a lot of experience on the roads policing side, which I can help and answer questions in relation to that. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to play a short video in a second, and this is from uh, Valerie Singleton. So. Valerie Singleton, many of you will recognize from basically television. Um, firstly, she has an OBE. She's a well-trusted and well-known journalist, travel writer and TV presenter. And many of you will remember her from her time on Blue Peter. I mean, who will never forget that time when she had the baby elephant being dragged across the studio? I mean, what chaos that caused. Um, she also has been very much heavily involved with older drivers work and has worked with GEM Motoring Assist to create safer driving into older age videos, which you can see on our website as well. So let me just get that video ready for you to view. Just gonna share my screen for you shortly. Okay, and let's play that video. Hello, we're delighted that you can join today's webinar. This webinar is just one of several webinars taking place this week, hosted by the Older Drivers Forum. Each webinar is on a different subject and designed to help and support you to carry on driving safely for longer. This week of webinars is to support the Project Edward Week of Action titled Fit for the Road. Project Edward stands for Every Day Without a Road Death, and it's an annual UK wide campaign for road safety. It's backed by government, the emergency services, highways agencies, road safety organisations and British businesses. Shockingly, on average, five people a day are killed and around 150,000 people are injured each year on roads in Great Britain. Unfortunately, 20% of all deaths on our roads are older people. As older licence holders is increasing every year, Fatalities for drivers aged 70 and over are forecast to increase by 22% by 2040. As an older driver myself, I am fully aware how we can't become complacent about our abilities. We all need to focus on our own road safety and making sure that we are fit for the road, not only to protect ourselves, but others. This week of webinars, I hope will give you lots of useful information and help us all become safer road users while supporting us to carry on driving safely for longer. I wish you all the very best and please stay safe. Well, thank you, Valerie, for that. And uh, it's really important that we remember the messages that Valerie's given us there. Um, so we have three speakers to speak to you today, and uh, through their help, we hope to allow you to think about doing driving appraisals and assessments and ultimately help you carry on driving safely for longer. Remember, we do have a Q&A section. So like I said, if you have any questions, then please type them and we'll answer them at the very end in the panel section. So let's go to our first speaker for the day. Her name is June Howlett, and she's going to be talking about driving appraisals. June is a road safety officer for Buckinghamshire Council with over 30 years experience. Her career in road safety started when she trained as an approved driving instructor and then became a driving examiner for four years before joining Buckinghamshire Council in 2002 as a road safety officer. June now oversees the council's education, training and publicity campaigns aimed at the most vulnerable road groups. June developed the driver training assessments the most popular being the older driver assessments. Since June 2017, June has held the voluntary position of company secretary for Road Safety GB. So welcome, June. Thank you for this. And I shall hand over to you. Thank you, Rob. I'm just going to share my screen and we'll get the presentation up. And if Rob can just confirm that you can see that. Yes, just needs to be the main screen coming up, June. Yep. We good? Yes, we are. That's fine. 
Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Rob. Um, that saves a few minutes. Now Rob's giving an overview. But um, just to say on my role within Buckinghamshire Council, I'm responsible for the road safety, education, training and publicity throughout the county. So this includes campaigns and driver training, which is aimed at the most vulnerable road user groups, of which older drivers are featuring more and more in our collisions. Um, but this isn't altogether surprising as the number of older drivers increases year on year. So during the presentation, I'm going to give you an overview of the Buckinghamshire Mature Driver Assessment Scheme. Um, I'll cover some of the data that guides us on what to include, how to apply, what happens on an assessment, feedback, how we support drivers after the assessment. And we've got a number of online modules and I'll tell you about those at the end. So this is just a flavor of the Buckinghamshire scheme, but they are being delivered all over the UK by other local authorities or organizations. Um, Graham's going to speak after me and he'll give you more information about how to find out about those and I'll also give you more information at the end about where to find out about assessments in your area. So currently over 5 million people aged 70 plus hold a driving license, though not all of those may still be driving. And at the age of 70, you are no more at risk of being involved in a collision than any other group. In fact, younger drivers are a higher risk on our roads. But the evidence suggests that after the age of 70, there is a slow increase in blameworthy collisions, with 85 year olds being over four times more likely to contribute to a collision than be innocently involved. We looked at the type of collisions and crashes that older drivers were having and found they're mainly rights of way collisions, so junctions, especially turning right across opposing traffic, roundabouts, merging from a slip road and changing lanes. And research has shown that in your mid 70s, drivers start to have problems assessing complex or high speed traffic situations. And this links to the top three contributory factors recorded by Thames Valley Police for older driver collisions, which are failed to look properly, failed to judge other person's path or speed and careless, reckless in a hurry. It's interesting to note that the main contributory factors for older drivers are very similar to those that are recorded for the younger groups as well. We found that older drivers are most likely to be at fault in reversing crashes, many of these happening on driveways and in car parks. Some may be kept pedal confusion or maybe not looking properly before reversing. So we sort of we do bring that up on the assessment um, just so people can be aware that they need to be careful when reversing. There's also evidence that driving in the dark and at peak times of the day uh, rush hour basically, have been shown to increase crash risk. But many older drivers self-regulate by choosing not to drive in the dark or at rush hour. There was also a, an interesting fact that was interaction with pets was one of the most commonly reported contributors to crashes or near misses. So if you have a pet in the car with you, please be careful you know, secure it. There's lots of great harnesses now for dogs um, or cages that you can put them in to travel with. Since 2001, um, Buckinghamshire had been running a scheme called SAGE, which was safer driving with age. And this was a basic driving assessment delivered by any driving instructor that was interested. Drivers got the application form signed by their doctor to say there's no medical reason why they couldn't take a driving assessment. And this worked really well until about 2011, when the doctor's practices started charging to get the form signed and we started getting complaints about the cost. So this seemed like a good time for us to review the scheme 
see if it was still needed. And if it was, is it still fit for purpose? And as I said on the previous slide, our data in indicated an increase in the number of older drivers being killed or injured. So we decided to update our assessment scheme to include information about where older drivers are most vulnerable, the types of crashes that they're most likely to be involved in, and health issues that affect us as we age. We have six approved driving instructors that deliver the scheme on our behalf. They've all had specialist training at our local mobility centre. And this was to improve their level of awareness on issues that affect drivers as they age and what simple changes or adaptions are available to help someone keep driving. And importantly, knowledge on where to signpost drivers for further help. We, we all visited the mobility centre and that was a, a really useful experience. We got to drive adapted vehicles and to understand the role of the regional driving assessment centre, mobility centres and how we could work with them. And I know you're going to hear more about their work in one of the next presentations. I think by using a small pool of driving instructors, we tend to meet for training on a regular basis chat there's always something coming up on assessments uh, that we choose to share and discuss and because they're delivering these on a regular basis we can be sure they're delivered in a consistent way our assessors have become really knowledgeable and very experienced and they all say that they really enjoy delivering these courses we also decided that as our assessments are just simple confidence givers, then we'd no longer require the application to be signed by the doctor. But we do ask applicants to declare any medical condition so that we can check that we're the right organisation to help them. And we didn't want assessments just to be about fault finding, but rather for a way for the assessors to work with drivers to make them aware of where they're most at risk and to help them manage or reduce the risk, especially at junctions and roundabouts. We're also very aware that if an older driver loses their license, they may also lose their ability to socialise and can become very isolated, which can lead to many problems. So our scheme aims to support drivers as they age to keep them driving for as long as they can safely do so or want to. And we're also there to support and advise families. So the assessment process, well, the objective of the assessment is to determine if a driver is safe to be driving on the roads. And if not, identify what can be done to help. Most of those that take an assessment say they're taking it to update their skills and to check that they're still safe. Reassurance, really. Some may not have driven for a while due to COVID or ill health or suddenly have to start driving because a partner's ill and maybe they've had to give up driving. The assessment process basically starts with the client applying either online by post or being signposted to us by a healthcare provider. I then assign an assessor who will contact the driver directly to book the drive. The assessors meet the client at their own home, spend a little time completing the paperwork, which is the form that you can see on the screen. And this gives the assessor an overview of the type of driving that person does, confidence level, and any areas of concern that they may have before we even get in the car. They also complete an eyesight test before the drive, reading a car number plate from 20 meters. And if they don't pass the eyesight test, then the drive won't go ahead. So if you're thinking of having an assessment, then do please make sure you can read a number plate at the prescribed distance. The drive is based on the type of driving that person does and what they want to achieve from it. So if they don't want to go up the motorway, we don't make them. If they want to look at a, a junction, a new road layout that's been bothering them, then that's what we would do. Some people want to practice parking or going into a new car park or route that they haven't done before. 
Occasionally we get drivers that have changed their car and they want someone to help them familiarize with it and how to use the technology on it. So the drive's basically built around the driver and any concerns that they may have. We also get asked about recommending cars when drivers are thinking of changing theirs. And it's difficult to know what will suit someone, but there are a few things that we would recommend. Buy as new as you can afford. They generally have more safety features and better protection for people both inside and outside the vehicle. Make sure that you sit in any car that you're considering and test the seating. Can you set it to the right height? I'm really short, so that's so important for me. Choose one that's got a good clear view, nice big windows when driving and also for doing maneuvers such as reversing. Some of them have really tiny um, back windows, which can make things difficult. Make sure you can see and operate all the controls. Can you push the pedals all the way down without pain or discomfort? Can you easily see the speedo from your normal driving position? And consider features that could make driving easier reversing parking aids and can you get in and out of it easily um, i've got a video here with, which is a cautionary tale so i'll just play that there's no sound with it but it's just to make sure that you don't get a car that's perhaps too low Be a little bit embarrassing going to the supermarket <laughs> and doing this. And you can see getting out's not the end of it. He's actually still got to get up. So just a cautionary tale, make sure you choose the right car for you. Let me just flick on to the next one. Oh, we went two on there. Okay, talking about the route, the route would be typical of the sort of driving that the driver would normally do, but it will include a parking exercise, perhaps at a supermarket, garden centre, or into your driveway at the end of the assessment. And this is an opportunity for us to highlight the risks when parking and reversing. The first part of the drive will be about 15 minutes. And once stopped, there's a brief chat about how the drive went, anything that happened and the assessor will give some feedback they have or suggestions for improvement which the driver can then practice on the second part of the drive. By this point everybody's usually quite relaxed and just driving as normal. For any it may be the first time they've had anyone assess their driving since they passed their driving test and that was maybe borne out by the poll Rob just did about you know, how long ago it was since you had a driving assessment. Before we start the second part of the drive, there's a short micro lesson on eyesight and hazard, hazard perception. Uh, a little bit more about that later. At the end of the drive, there's a debrief, which family members or interested parties are welcome to listen to if the driver wants them to. We do ask the driver how they felt the drive went, as it's important to get the driver's impression of how they think they did, so that we can see if it correlates with the assessor's opinion of the drive. Notes from the drive are recorded on the assessment form, and that's then shared with the driver, which means all comments and thoughts can be discussed to ensure everything is understood. Quite often there are questions on things that happen during the drive, and the assessors have diagrams that they can show to help explain anything that's not clear, such as roundabouts. I think common issues are recognizing speed limits, lane positioning, roundabouts, junctions, mirrors and gears, observation, hazards, and reversing. I must say a lot do seem to relate to observation, roundabouts, and positioning. Uh, I remember one of the instructors telling me about a lady who said that she hated turning right 
across a busy main road that she had to use to get out of her estate. And she told the assessor that she usually turned left, went down to a roundabout and then came back up the other way. But she said that she felt she should be able to cross that road as an experienced motorist. But as the assessor told her, she, she'd come up with a great solution, take the stress out of it, reduce the risk, and it probably took no longer than waiting for a safe gap. So don't be afraid to simplify, simplify things for yourself. If there's a, a safer, easier way to do it, then that would seem like a really good choice to me. Once the assessment's finished, the assessor will give the driver his opinion on how the drive went, the outcome. And just for reference, the picture there shows Paddy Hopkirk, um, who was one of our more famous older drivers that took an assessment. And Paddy won the Monte Carlo Rally in a Mini Cooper in 1964. He still drives the Mini, and it was definitely one of the fastest assessments I'd ever sat in. Outcomes. So mostly drivers will know how they've done. So the result isn't usually a surprise. There are a range of options our assessors can give at the end of the drive. Three main ones that I'll tell you about, but lots of grey areas in between. So briefly, they are satisfactory, maybe with a few recommendations to work on. And this is the outcome for the majority of our clients. If all has gone well, we'd agree a reassessment date with the client and write to remind them near, nearer the time generally between one and three or five years, but that would depend on when they felt they wanted one. Um, another option would be that the assessor may feel that the client would benefit from further lessons if there are areas of concern. The majority do take the extra lessons and some then want another assessment soon after. Others are happy to do the lessons and then agree another assessment when they felt they might like one in the future. Um, I, I think the last option would be where we feel that we cannot help as it's outside our scope. And this would be approximately about 2% of clients. Um, and these are usually down to medical conditions. And we would then, if they want a second opinion, refer them to the mobility centre for more specialist help. As I said, our assessments are a simple assessment, just about reassurance, building confidence and supporting drivers as they age. A way to check their driving is OK for their peace of mind but we're not medically trained. And the mobility centers are there for the drivers that we feel we cannot help. In the majority of these cases where the drive is unsafe, the driver usually knows the time has come to cease driving and is looking for a professional opinion to confirm their own thoughts. Sometimes drivers tell us they feel pressure to keep driving, perhaps because they're being relied on to drive other family members about. And this can be difficult when they recognize that perhaps they shouldn't be driving anymore. We try to work with those drivers and see what options are available to help them stay mobile. There are many volunteer organizations that can help when there are no regular bus routes. For those that live in Buckinghamshire, the Community Transport Hub provides information on all aspects of community transport. But be assured, we do everything we can to support a driver to keep driving for as long as they can safely do so. The assessment is then followed up with a full report of the drive and any recommendations. So they have the feedback in writing and there's no ambiguity. Some drivers sh share these with their doctors, family members, or maybe even when they do their license renewal or insurance. Most drivers are happy to agree to a, recess, uh, a reassessment in the future. And about a third of all our assessments each year are in fact reassessments. I think once someone's had an assessment, they see the benefit. It's a bit like having a regular health check for your driving. And I think they realize that if they keep their skills up, then they should be able to drive with confidence into the future.
I mentioned earlier that when we have the first stop on the drive, the assessor will ask the driver to complete a vision and hazard perception mini lesson. And the aim is just to increase awareness of several issues that drivers may experience in the future. We discuss how our clarity of vision decreases with age, glare recovery, and how the time taken to regain sight after being dazzled by car lights or the sun increases with age. An example of that, at the age of 15, your eye of sight will recover from glare in two seconds, whereas at 65, this will increase to around nine seconds. You know, hence why we don't really like driving at night. I know I find it a lot more difficult now. Our field of vision also reduces as we age. And by the time we're in our 70s, we could have lost between 20 and 30 degrees of our peripheral vision. And this can lead to difficulties when making decisions or emerging at junctions or changing lanes, all areas where older driver collisions occur. We also highlight how our hazard perception skills decline with age, but this can be improved with video-based training, which can be found on our older driver modules, and I'll give you some details at the end. On the practical drive, we talk about visual searches, where and when to look, scanning, spotting, recognizing hazards, all these help things help to improve reaction times. We discuss help in the form of additional mirrors to help with that reduced field of vision, technology, lane assist, blind spot detectors, and simply moving the head more, especially at junctions, unless of course there are issues with mobility where we would look at mirrors to help. This section takes just about 10 minutes and it's also a bit of a chance to take a break from driving. Who takes a driving assessment? Well, it varies. I think with our assessments being voluntary, the majority just want to check they're still okay and haven't picked up any bad habits. The majority are male in their 80s, which is great, especially as we identified the risk going up with age for those in their 80s. The oldest that's done one of our assessments is 98. So I am still waiting for my 100 year old driver if we've got any volunteers out there. We average about 150 assessments a year, obviously not last year due to COVID, but hopefully, you know, we will soon be back on track. We've been really busy this year and we're almost back up to full numbers already. This is our most popular assessment. And I think it's because it's non-threatening, aims to support drivers really. We also attend public events, health fairs, uh, garden centres, that type of thing, to promote our assessments. And this gives us a chance to explain what the assessment's about and reassure drivers that it's designed to help them and not stop them from driving. Uh, I said I'd mention the online modules. We developed an online module for older drivers and their families. This covers many of the issues that I've discussed in this presentation, such as eyesight, but also includes information on medication, fatigue, distractions, journey planning, information about vehicle adaptions and licensing. There are also some hazard perception videos on there for you to practice your scanning techniques. It takes about 15 minutes to complete and it's free to access. The address is on the screen, but if anybody wants more information, then do contact me. There's also a module on speed management, which will help you with recognizing speed limits, um, especially for the type of road you're on and the vehicle that you're driving. And there's also a winter driving module on there, which sadly, as we move into the autumn, uh, you know, may be of some use to you. They're free and you can access them from wherever you are in the country. And finally, I've added some useful contact details on this slide. So information there about our older driver assessments and the e-learning module. The older driver forum, where you can find out about driving assessments offered nationally and the driving mobility website for more specialist help and the Buckinghamshire Community Transport Hub. I'm sure they've got the community transport 
in all areas. So have a look on your local authority uh, website for more information about that. So I do hope the information was useful, maybe even makes you consider an assessment. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm going to hand you back over to Rob now, and I'll join you again later for any questions that you might have. Thank you. And I'll stop sharing my screen and back to Rob. Well, thank you very much, June, for that. Very useful. And uh, just um, thank you for all the questions that are coming in. Happy for you to uh, send more in. Just to remind people, uh, June's talking about her Buckingham scheme. What we're trying to do is give you a fair representative of what courses are kind of available across the country. So you may not be in Buckinghamshire area, but we have many courses that cover the whole of the country. So our website, we have a page called courses on our website where you can locate courses in your area and it gives you all the costs and various different things on that. So, but we'll be covering a lot of this again in Graham's talk and we'll also be covering um, it in the questions and answers later. So we're now gonna move on to our next speaker. It's Graham Millwood, who will be talking about driving assessments and refresher training. Graham is a senior road safety officer for Hampshire County Council, and he leads on Hampshire's driver skills 60 plus for the last 12 years. In this time, he has observed driver behaviour in many different situations and worked closely with other local agencies, including the local driving mobility centre. This experience, along with his background as a driving driver trainer has enabled him to gain a good understanding of the needs of older drivers and particularly how to mitigate risk as the aging process begins to have an increasing albeit uh, albeit gradual effect so thank you graham for joining us today if you might recognize graham he joined us on monday for one of our uh, talks so thank you very much graham i shall hand over to you okay <clears throat> thank you rob uh yes just bear with me and we just make that screen big. OK, can you see that now, Rob? Yes, that's all fine. Thank you very much. OK. Um, yes, as Rob said, I um, I did a uh, presentation on um, Monday, which I think seemed to go quite well. Uh, there was a little bit of an issue with the videos for anybody that saw it or indeed watches it back. So I apologise for that. It didn't seem to be happening here. I wasn't aware of it at the time. Uh, so I hope it didn't uh, um, interrupt your enjoyment too much on that. Uh, I was also told earlier when we did a, a quick run through that there were some uh, grey boxes coming up on my screen. Again, I haven't got those, so I hope they're not there. I've done everything I can to correct that. So uh, I run the Hampshire County Council Drivers Skill Scheme 60 plus. I've been doing that for 12 years now. So it's a passion of mine. Um, but before we go on, I just want to make one thing very clear is because this is 60 plus, this is not targeted uh, assessments anyway in general are not targeted just at older drivers. We run schemes as many other councils do for uh, younger drivers and business drivers. This one is this particular scheme is specific for people over 60. Um, who would benefit? This is just really reinforcing what June has just said. So anyone that uh, hasn't done any form of driver training since passing their test. So let's just do a little bit of history, if you like. Um, when we go back to when we were five or six years old, and of course, for some of us, that's uh, driving was completely different in those days. But effectively, what happens when we first sit in the car with uh, a family member, it may be a, a, a parent or an uncle, auntie. Um, we watch what they do and we watch what they do for many, many years, uh, so at least 10, 12 years uh, before we start taking driving lessons from a driving instructor that eventually gets us through our test. Now, the driving instructor will have to correct some habits, certainly, that we've picked up over the years by watching and of course get us to control the car to pass the test on a generally a fairly straightforward route. And then of course, like many people say, that's when we really start to learn. And of course, what happens is those little habits that we've picked up from our parents come back in because you know that's the way we drive. When we're younger, our eyesight and our reaction times and the way we process information tends to 
counterbalance some of those habits. You know, we get away with it. We don't have accidents and, and we build on that success. So the reason why these schemes are offered often is because the natural aging process means that our eyesight changes very gradually. Uh, it takes us longer to process information. This is a very gradual process. But as the years go by, those habits we picked up and we've got away with over the years become more important because we can't react so well. So the reason we start, and many schemes start, start from 60 years old is, you know, first of all, you know, that, that is those drivers in their 60s and early 70s are some of the safest drivers out there, certainly safer than the newly qualified uh, younger drivers. But we need to get their habits right as they enter older age. So that's why we offer them. Um, and just excuse me one second, because the pictures on the right, I'm just going to see if I can shift those out of the way, are just in my way a little bit. OK, uh, anyone who feels they should they are not able to deal with certain road situations, such as roundabouts, joining motorways. Uh, Joy, um, June mentioned that. Anyone who has passengers that complain now, I know there are some passengers that are always complaining and are very nervous. But in general, the vast majority, I would say that if you have passengers that are complaining, there is something not quite right with your driving. You're either your safety margins aren't good enough, you're going a little bit too fast, and it means the passengers are feeling unsafe. And one definition of a, of a good driver is that the passengers should be able to relax and feel comfortable. So I would always take that seriously. Anyone who finds it difficult to focus on their driving, uh, this can come for a number of reasons, distractions, stress in the lifestyle, all sorts of things, or it can come from a medical condition. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And I know Rachel's going to mention that type of thing uh, on the following the, um, presentation. Anyone who has lost confidence, now this could be because they've had an accident, they've been off driving for several months for various reasons, or as often was the case many years ago, it tended to be the, the man who did the driving a married, in a married couple and the, and the lady tended to sit in the passenger seat because, you know, even when she drove, she tended to be criticised. So she didn't drive and she's lost a lot of confidence through that and then suddenly has to start driving for whatever reason. So we can particularly, our assessors can particularly uh, in this type of assessment um, work on that and help people with that once they find out what the uh, reasons behind it is. June mentioned changing cars. Um, you know, we had a, a webinar yesterday. I don't know if anybody saw it. Very interested on electric vehicles and car technology. Uh, and that com that's complicated and, and our assessors can guide on that type of thing if they know that's what somebody wants. Anyone who has been caught speeding, well, you know, uh, often when we get caught speeding, it's human nature. We say, well, we were just unlucky. We don't normally speed. But two things I would say. First of all, if somebody is caught speeding, it may, not always, but it may portray uh, a thing that that is a little bit of a habit because clearly if you're speeding every day on a 30 mile an hour limit, one day you're going to get caught. Um, so it may portray that the habit there, maybe without realising it, is, is not quite right. And there's techniques we can help with that about the gear use and looking ahead. And of course, the other thing is concentration, because speed cameras are bright, yellow things. And but yet we drive on autopilot sometimes. So we can help with that. We can give people tools how to read the road. Anyone who has had others sound the horn at them and react badly to something, there's normally a reason for that and it can be solved very simply. I've done that several times in, myself in the past with people. And finally, anyone who hasn't had an assessment update in the last two or three years, which covers most people, um, it's always useful. You can always learn. Frequently asked ask questions, will I bet be expected to drive like on a test? A resounding answer, no, because if you're driving differently to how you normally drive, I would ask, is there any point in doing an assessment? I think most people are capable of, uh, of a decent standard of driving, but we want to see what you do on a daily day, on a day-to-day -day basis to see what risks 
you're exposed to. So for example, if our assessors see someone feeding the steering wheel very carefully through their hands and it doesn't look natural, you know, that can be more dangerous. So um, just do what you normally do because that's the point of having these assessments. What happens if the assessor doesn't think I'm a good driver? Well, they give advice how you can improve those uh, habits or whatever it is that's causing the problem. Um, generally, we can't, certainly we can't stop you driving. We can't take your license away, however bad a driver you are. There are only two reasons why somebody can lose a license. One is the courts can uh, take it away, such as uh, if you get caught drink driving. Um, or the other thing is if there's a medical condition, which under the rules that the uh, licensing people, DVLA issue, um, makes you unfit to drive. You can't lose your license just for being a bad driver. Uh, so we've answered that one. Um, why do I need an assessment? I've never had an accident. Well, I mentioned that earlier, really. You know, habits play a bigger part as we lose our, as eyesight changes and we lose our ability to think really quickly. Um, and it's not about whether an accident's happened in the past. You want to get to the end of your driving career without having an accident, because there's always one thing I, that comes to me is you can only have one fatal accident in your in your life, unfortunately. Um, and we certainly don't want that to happen to anybody. Will I be testing on the highway code? No, no not formally. Uh, most assessments that I'm aware of, um, certainly on ours, we'd expect a driver to be up to date on the highway code. So it's always a good idea to read it, but you don't have to revise the day before the assessment. We want to see what you're, where you are at the moment, really. Will I be able to choose the roads I drive on? Uh, yes, to a degree, but there's no point in doing an assessment with a straightforward left turn um, out of your end of your road along a nice, easy country road, round about, about for, um, and then back again, because that doesn't really assess. We want to see some roundabouts, some right turns, some pre you know, preferably dual carriageway, typical roads included on that. So you work together with the assessment normally on that. I'm very nervous to be assessed. What can I do? Well, certainly all our assessments, and I'm sure June would agree, and, and, and um, anybody else that runs an assessment would agree that one of the key things here is to put people at ease, um, not sit there with a a sort of a, a clipboard and a pen and, and and you know you remember that the driver examiner or instructor hits the dashboard and you have to do an emergency stop at a given time we just want to see you drive we want to be a passenger now we try not to distract you but we also try and break the ice we try and make it so that you're not nervous Will my family find out about the outcome? Well, as far as I'm aware all of these assessments certainly the one we do in Hampshire is confidential even if a family member asked us afterwards without the driver's permission, we can't tell them. Of course, all organisations have a duty of care if there's a real danger to public safety to do something about that. But we'd always, always work with the driver first. What type of driving assessments are available across the country? Because we know, as said earlier, many of you won't come from Hampshire or Buckinghamshire. Um, so just a quick going over there institute of advanced motorists generally when you google google um or search for older drivers assessments this one comes at the top of the list um i'll talk a little bit about that that's uh, iam road smart that's run by rosper certainly well very well known for driver training they do the advanced tests you can join a rosper group as you can uh, join an iam group um, ROSPA used to have a specific assessment. Um, I haven't seen it on their website recently, but it may be worth, worth asking them whether they have a dedicated one for um, you, you know, the older driver market, if you like. Local authorities, as Hampshire and Buckinghamshire do, um, we'll talk about those in a moment. And the normal driving schools, the national ones, or the local driving instructors uh, tend to work um, by themselves. Um, those ones are also relevant in some many circumstances. And then the specialist assessments. This is what Rachel's going to talk about next, but I'll, so I'll just briefly mention that at the end of my presentation. So this just comes from the website, really, the IAM Road Smart um, uh, assessment. 
a mature driver a review uh, so all of these assessments tend to be in your own vehicle this type of assessment does um, the cost for that one is 65 pounds i understand they're one hour duration but they tend to be on roads you know very well the local authorities um, so there's Hampshire and Buckinghamshire there, but many other local authorities offer these. I haven't put a list. I don't know if June's going to put that. I think she mentioned later, but bearing in mind, these things do change. So it's always worth ringing your local uh, council, uh, get in touch with the local road safety team. Um, sometimes these are run by the fire and rescue uh, organization. Um, so many of those are available. Uh, the one in Hampshire costs £45 for a 90-minute session. Driving schools. So you get national franchises such as BSM, AA and Red Driving Schools. There are many others. There are others as well, certainly, you can look up. Um, you may also, as I mentioned, be able to find a local uh, independent driver trainer, um, mainly through recommendations is the best, best bet to to find out someone that's used them in the past, maybe even as a learner, a driver. Um, however, word of caution, it's not always as straightforward for the following reasons. Especially, especially after the COVID um, pandemic, driving instructors, that certainly the better ones, are extremely busy. So they have a full up diary every week. So it may be a long wait before they can slot anybody in just for a one off assessment. Um, and they are very, very accomplished at teaching learners, and they certainly know their stuff, but actually it's a different skill set is needed to maximise the benefits for older drivers. And certainly when we, uh, we train uh, assessors for our scheme, it takes a lot of um, change in the way they work to be suitable for dealing with a more experienced driver. It's just a different approach. So the knowledge is there, but the approach, you just got to be um, a little bit careful of that you pick the right one you ask are they are they used to dealing with experienced motorists so ensure you emphasize that when you when you're looking for an instructor um, okay so then we move on to the specialist assessment and training services the driving mobility centers I'm not going to talk too much about this because this is what Rachel's talking about next but these are, uh, they use driving assessors and occupational therapists working together. So these are specialist ass um, assessments for people on the one hand that need adaptions for vehicles. So for example, um, one of the things which happened uh, over the last few years is uh, particularly when you look at Afghanistan and Iraq, there were young soldiers coming back having lost limbs, sometimes lost, you know, more than one. And they need special adaptions. And um, an organization like the Driver Mobility uh, Organization is able to find out what adaptions work, offer a solution, and train the, the driver to, to use that. Um, and there's also a thorough investigation where a medical condition exists which may affect driving. So typically, um, cognitive impairment, a dementia, a stroke, Parkinson's, this type of thing. These are the people that the DVLA rely on to give a, a really good assessment of somebody's fitness to drive. So these are the people which, um, if somebody's in that situation, really need to be uh, looking up their nearest one and they're dotted across the country uh, and, and going to them. So which assessment do I choose? Well, this depends really. Um, I've put up there reasons for needing the assessment, availability of service, cost and suitability. So uh, on the reasons, if it's just a uh, one on the one hand, a confidence builder or, or somebody's just worried about um, a family member just getting on in age a little bit, maybe no medical conditions that they know of uh, present. Um, then one of these voluntary ones I talked about earlier are, are normally certainly the first point of call. If it's because of a medical condition, Normally, it would be certainly the driving mobility centres uh, would be the first point of call. And we have a very good relationship with our local one, because if somebody contacts them and they think we can deal with it, they will refer them back to us. 
but generally for the medical conditions I mentioned, these would be the people to go for. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out on suitability that, and this is really important, is that all the driving uh, sort of approved driving instructors that operate on the driving assessments I've just talked about are very good at understanding driving, looking to see how they can help people. But they don't generally have background on the medical effects on driving. And the problem if somebody who is in that situation tries to assess somebody with, say, a dementia, they may give false confidence. They may not understand what they're really looking for and see a reasonable style of driving on these roads that they uh, know very well. And then that makes it very difficult for doctors and, and specialists to say, uh, you know, there's a problem here because they just hold up this bit of paper they've had from the assessor and say, well, this person told me I was good. So we have to be very careful. We've slightly looked at that in Hampshire, but I won't go into that now. Uh, but we've certainly come to understand the needs of some of these um, drivers and we work very closely with our local mobility centre on that. So that's it from me. Um, if uh, anybody wants to know more about the Hampshire scheme, uh, road.safety at Han hans.gov.uk and I'm always happy to talk to people and advise wherever you come from um, but for now back to Rob thank you uh, if I can sorry just going up to share my stop sharing my screen Rob well thank you Graham thank you for that really good input about what are driving assessments across the country and select selections of where you can get them and what's available so that really was very informative we appreciate that uh, and we'll speak to um, Graham a little later in our panel session to answer some of the questions um, our next speaker is Rachel Odell who is talking to us about the role of the driving mobility centers and assessments they offer um, so Rachel is the centre manager for Wessex Drivability, who are one of the many driving mobility centres in the UK. Rachel, Rachel leads as a team professional of, sorry, start again. Rachel leads a team of professional driving assessors, a mixture of approved driving instructors and occupational therapists, along with a small team of client administrators. So I think uh, we'll pass over to Rachel. And uh, thank you very much, Rachel. I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Rob. Um, just to say, I've got my camera on at the moment, but it can be a little bit distracting. It sometimes starts to flicker. So if that happens, then I will switch it off as soon as possible. Uh, let me just share my screen. There we go. So hopefully... That's all working fine. Okay. Lovely. Thank you for that. Okay. So yeah, thanks for the introduction, Rob. Um, I'm Rachel O'Dell, Centre Manager at one of the driving mobility assessment centres that uh, Graham has alluded to and also June in their talks. I'm based in uh, well, Wessex Drivability. We're based down in Southampton, uh, but I appreciate some of you are coming from all around the country. So there will be a local driving mobility centre available to you. Um, so just to, to mention what um, Graham was saying there, that there is a big difference between the general, I'm flickering already, so I'm just going to get rid of that. Okay, there we go. So uh, just to say that the, the main difference between our assessments and the local authority ones that were mentioned by June and Graham there is the, the input of the occupational therapist on our assessment. So this is the clinical input that we have over and above the um, impact or, or the input from the driving instructor on our assessment. So it's a full comprehensive review that we offer, mostly based around people with medical conditions, as Graham mentioned. Not always. There are some cases where we uh, will assess someone who is uh, suspected of having a medical condition or is, you know, simply just an elderly person. Um, but generally speaking, we are looking at uh, drivers with medical conditions and looking to see how that may be impacting on their safe driving. 
So our referral routes then, we get drivers from a number of different routes. A lot of people are referred to us by the DVLA themselves. So the DVLA will send us a referral and also the driver themselves will get a letter saying that they need to attend. So it's not really uh, voluntary in this case, unfortunately. Uh, their license is in question, perhaps due to their medical condition, and they do need to attend an assessment with their local mobility centre. Um, unfortunately, usually the case is either a Attend or the DVLA will revoke the license. So that one really is, is non-negotiable. There is then, of course, the self-referral route. So it could be that a family member or a GP has said to a driver, well, look, you know, you, you've got a medical condition. We can't really say how it's affecting your driving. Or in the case of the family, they might say, well, we think it is affecting your driving. Why don't you go and get checked out? So we may get some people who come and just want to self-refer um, just to see that everything's OK and that medical condition is not impacting on their safe driving. So again, as Graham mentioned, Motability send us some uh, assessments, some people who might have something that has affected their ability to control the car in a normal way. So they might want to look at adaptations. Uh, we're going to focus today on the fitness to drive side of things, but we do see clients, as Graham mentioned, they may have lost a limb or they may have lost the use of a limb via a stroke, for example. So we will work with those clients to look at adaptations. And then there's the NHS or the GP route, sort of slightly outside the self-referral route here. This is where a GP might have some more serious concerns about somebody and they would liaise directly with us or the you know, their local centre to actually refer that patient. And quite often in some cases, if an NHS or a GP referral is received by the centre, then there is a, um, a discount on the assessment price. So um, you know, via that, uh, that route. And in some cases, some centres actually offer those completely free. And then finally, the one I wanted to mention was the local police forces. At the moment, six driving mobility centres around the country are working with their local police forces on a scheme, which was actually initiated by Rob. Um, where a driver has had an incident on the road that is, is looked at as being at fault. So if someone's pulled out of a junction or knocked a cyclist off, for example, and where that driver would otherwise be prosecuted uh, for their driving, they can come instead to us for a driving assessment and you know, see if they actually should still be driving um, or you know, if there's something going on. And those are the type of people which are likely maybe not have a medical condition. I mean, in some cases, an accident can just happen. It doesn't necessarily link back to a medical condition, but in some cases it can. So thinking about our medical conditions, then I would like Rob to pop up uh, a poll that we've prepared for you just to see what you think would be the most common medical condition of drivers that we assess. So just going to give you a few seconds just to cast your votes there with the types. I mean, these are some types of medical conditions, but the most common one that you think we see. Rachel, just one bit. If I could just ask you to speak a bit louder, people are asking that. Oh, OK, no problem. I'll raise my voice. Hopefully that's better for people. OK, fantastic. So the results are in. Uh, I'd like to say you've all done incredibly well. You've got the correct answer there. Uh, I'll just move on to my next slide. But uh, absolutely, the most common um, medical condition if you would like to close the poll oh, sorry do you want me to read out the result oh, no that's fine um so yes the most oh, it's back uh, so yes 55 percent of you have gone for dementia followed by 32 percent on stroke there uh nine percent parkinson's and four percent multiple sclerosis and uh, that's that's pretty much spot on between you you have hit on the uh the answers um these are a sort of breakdown of the most common types of medical conditions that we would see. This is, uh, or these are stats from us, particularly at Wessex drivability, uh, but I would imagine that it, you know, very similar effect across all the driving mobility centres across the country. So you can see there that the most common that we see is dementia or Alzheimer's, followed by the stroke, they're quite close, and then elderly frail because of those people who come to us via the police scheme. Those are our next most common types of people. So we've got a whole range there of, of different medical conditions that we do see, but dementia being the most common. 
Um, of course, as uh, I think Graham mentioned, some of these are actually notifiable to the DVLA. So those four examples I gave in the poll are actually notifiable to the DVLA. So it's quite important, you know, as I say, if you do get a new diagnosis of something, um, you know, do check on the government website whether you do actually need to tell the DVLA of that medical condition. And there is a link there um, that we put in the presentation. I think um, they, can, they can be circulated to you afterwards. Um, so, you know, if you don't have a pen and paper handy now, we can circulate those. Um, but it's really important to get in touch with the DVLA if you have a newly diagnosed medical condition or something that has worsened since you gained your license and to, to report to the DVLA. And um, please be aware, it doesn't necessarily mean the DVLA will stop you driving or even send you for an assessment. It's just to be aware that there are some conditions there. And if we have anybody who is a medical professional joining us today, there's a link for you at the bottom there. That's a much more comprehensive um, link it is several pages long that website which will give you good guidance on when things should be notified if you're not sure. So moving on then, what, what happens during our fitness to drive assessments? And you'll notice from what I tell you that there are some similarities between the uh, local authority ones, which June has uh, told us more about this morning. And there are some, some very fundamental differences. The first being, as I mentioned, the fact that we have the clinical input from an occupational therapist on all of our fitness to drive assessments. And uh, that's because of the first part of the assessment or partly because of the first part of the assessment. This is the pre-drive. Again, June mentioned that that would happen during the, the, the Buckinghamshire assessments, but we do something similar. So we don't go straight out in the car with the driver. What we want to do first, again, very important, the visual testing to make sure that the driver does meet the legal standards to go out on the road or we cannot take them out on that assessment. So we need to see that they can read a number plate from the minimum legal distance, which is 20 metres. And then we'll talk to the drivers about their medical history. So is this a newly diagnosed condition that they have? Uh, has anything happened in the past? Have they had a stroke? When was that stroke? What's their recovery time? That type of thing. And any medication that they're taking for the condition and how that might affect their driving. We want to know about all these things before we, we uh, commence on the on-road. So it forms a very big picture of what could be going on with that driver. So then we also want to know about their driving history. So how long have they held their license? Uh, how many times a week do they drive? What sort of distances do they do? You know, do they like motorway driving? Do they only stay locally? They only want to go to the shops and, and for medical appointments or do they want to go and visit relatives in Scotland in their car? There's a, a vast range of different driving that our clients do. But we're also interested in what they've done driving wise uh, in the past. We've had people who've been bus drivers, taxi drivers. We've had sales reps that are used to driving 60,000 miles a year in their cars in previous history and how they feel that they could continue to drive that's very important so then we'll undertake a physical review with them as well some medical conditions especially things like stroke multiple sclerosis for example will affect people's uh, physical abilities to control a car safely so it may be that they have a weakness in a limb or with Parkinson's for example they might get tremors and how is that going to affect them in the car can they grip the steering wheel we want to see those things in the assessment room first to see the strength in their limbs and their ability to move those limbs. Uh, maybe simply could they turn their head to look over their shoulder to look in their blind spot? Is that going to affect them? And then we also perform a reaction time test. So it's a set of pedals, a little bit like you might find in the car. And we set a computer program going to look at a set of traffic lights. And when the light changes, we want to see the driver move their, their foot from one pedal to the other as if they're braking for a traffic light. And then we record those reaction times um, as part and parcel of our findings of the assessment. A normal reaction time for interest would be about um, half a second for somebody who's in tip top condition, but we're looking for something, anything up to 0.8 of a second to consider safe. 
And then most importantly, the occupational therapist will carry out some cognitive screening. So especially with things like stroke, again, multiple sclerosis sometimes, dementia especially, we want to see how people's brains are functioning in relation to their driving. It's very important that we can make that link between their medical condition, their cognitive uh, thinking, and how they're going to behave on the road. It's, it's only an indicator. Doesn't necessarily mean to say if somebody doesn't do well in the cognitive screening, we would never just recommend somebody stop driving based on that. We always base it really on what we see on the road. That's the most important thing. However, the two do usually marry up and one is evidence of another so we do form or put both together to form part of the assessment so then we give a little uh, brief on what's going to happen next for that person so they understand what will happen on the next part which is going on the road okay so the on-road assessment then what we do first again the assessments take place in our centre vehicles. It's another fundamental difference between the uh, local authority assessments and our assessments. We have to have people in a dual braked vehicle. It's really important because we really don't know from one day to the next, one assessment to another, how the driver is going to perform in the car. And we, you know, we've had some incidences where we really needed that dual brake. Um, so it's very important for everybody's safety. The assessment takes place in one of our vehicles. And of course, people are very uh, worried about that. It's not their familiar vehicle and it can make them very anxious. And we do understand that. So what we do first is give them some familiarization in that vehicle. We don't go straight out on the road with them. We allow them some time on an off-road area to get familiar with the vehicle, uh, to learn how the controls work, get used to the steering and the gears, um, get the seating right, get their mirrors adjusted, just to make sure everything's as comfortable as possible for them and they're as calm and relaxed as they possibly can. And to be honest, we do find that people adjust very well. They become, you know, they're very nervous to start with, but within sort of five or six minutes of driving around in that car without any other vehicles present, we do find that people settle down and then it's on their say so. As soon as they say that they feel comfortable to go out on the road, that's when we start to progress the assessment. Um, again, a big difference on our routes, it is a standardised route, and this is partly because we are a driving mobility centre, it is expected that any client going to any centre should have the same standard of assessment. It's no good uh, you know, client saying, well, I'll go to that centre because I've heard that the assessment is easier or the route is less, less complicated. All driving mobility centres are accredited and our routes are very important so that we have the right obstacles on the routes for familiar everyday driving. So, you know, we're not looking for anything too complicated, but we want to see drivers doing things like roundabouts, left turns, right turns, traffic lights, giveaways, zebra crossings, that type of thing. Everything is factored into our assessment so that we can see the driver performing a number of tasks, not just their own familiar roads. But again, like the others have said, this is not a learner style test. It's very important to stress that. We want to see someone driving safely, um, but it doesn't have to be to test standard. You know, we want to see somebody driving within the speed limit um, and you're know, performing correctly on the road, but we're not looking for maneuvers like emergency stops or turning around in the road, hill starts, parallel parking. We don't do that sort of thing. It's just that everyday but safe driving ability. That's the most important thing to stress. Um, but during the assessment, the uh, driving instructor will sit in the front of the car and they will be telling the driver what route to take, um, but their focus is keeping the car safe. So all the marking is done by the occupational therapist who accompanies and sits in the back of the car. So they don't say anything during the assessment, but they are noting down what happens and scoring manoeuvres. So we also include an exercise on driving independently as part of the assessment. So at this point, the driving instructor will not say anything apart from, I would like you to follow the signs for a certain place. So they will give a place name and then it's up to the driver to pick those place names out of each road sign that they pass. So if they come to a roundabout, they will need to position themselves for that roundabout in the correct lane to take the exit for the place name. So it's very important, uh, your test of memory, 
Can the driver remember the place name? Certainly, you know, with dementia clients, that could be difficult for them. They may have forgotten it by the time they come to the next roundabout and not know where they're going. So we need to see that they can drive on their own. You know, a lot of clients say, well, I always have my wife in the car, um, you know, and, and she tells me where to go if I forget. But you think, well, what if the wife is unavailable for any reason? You know, if she's taken ill and can't be there and the driver does need to drive for any reason. They can, we can't always guarantee they will have someone helping them do that. So we want to see us a key driving skills. That's the important thing. So control of the car, appropriate use of gears uh, in a manual car, for example, um, correct use of pedals. We don't want to see harsh braking or accelerating. Um, so it's a lot of different things that come into the assessment. But throughout the drive at the first part, um, again, a bit like uh, on June's assessments, we do give constructive feedback. It's not like a test where the examiner will keep completely quiet and let you make your own mistakes. We will help the driver. So we will give feedback um, because we want to see how that's acted upon. Of course, a lot of people get into bad habits. Again, as Graham mentioned earlier, uh, yeah, a few of us have forgotten our mirror checks. Um, so we will help the driver and say perhaps, oh, you exited that roundabout but you didn't look over your left shoulder to see if there was another car um, so on the next roundabout we would like to see you do that so it's then up to the driver to act on that advice and it's still part of the assessment effectively to see if they can retain the advice they've been given and they can act upon it so that's a, a very key part of the assessment even though the driver might not realize that so you know we will help but then of course we want to see improvement and if that isn't shown you know in the second part of the drive will keep much more quiet and we want to see if the driver can improve and if they can't improve then obviously it, it is likely to lead to an unsafe result. And as I say, the most important thing is we are looking to marry this all up. So we want to see how is their medical condition affecting their driving. So we're looking at that cognitive score from the test we did earlier, along with what we see on the road and linking them together. Most importantly, as Graham said, nobody takes a license away because someone's a bad driver. However, if the bad driving is linked to a medical condition, then that's an issue. So we don't realise it. Sometimes we, we get in the car and driving to most of us is second nature, but there are so many skills that are actually required for safe everyday driving. So first of all, the sequencing and coordination. So think about your mirror signal manoeuvre. So you, you need to do those things in the correct order for the right results. So you need to think about um, sequencing again, um, you know, changing down a gear if you're approaching a roundabout. We want to see that people can be doing that and thinking ahead what is necessary to perform the next thing they want to do. And then a thing called visuospatial perception. So again, we see this quite commonly a lot with stroke patients, for example. Their thought and what they see of their own driving on the road is that they might be driving perfectly down the middle of a lane. But in reality, they're actually driving perhaps with one wheel on the line in the centre, or they might be, might be very close to the left-hand curb, but that's not how they see it. So we want to see that someone's idea of what is happening on the road marries up with what's actually happening. And then, as I mentioned, that you know, the physical ability to actually operate the, con the, the controls. So is a limb weakness, meaning that they can no longer change gear properly or appropriately in a manual vehicle? It might be that we suggest that they swap to uh, an automatic and that could result in them being safe. Um, but, you know, things on the input on the steering, for example, are they able to turn a wheel correctly? Um, and you know, to the appropriate degree to make the corner. Um, you know, our driving instructors sometimes have to have input in the steering where a driver simply doesn't have the physical strength to perform the manoeuvre necessary. But as I mentioned, again, it's that response to advice. We're assessing that all the time. So did they learn from what we told them? Did they take it in? And did they act on that on the next uh, manoeuvre that they perform? So attention, very, very important that somebody's attention is focused on the road and what's happening around in the immediate vicinity of the car. Um, a lot of the time we will see drivers who are self-distracting and they'll say, oh, my neighbour's got a dog like that. And they're looking out the window at somebody walking a dog down the road. Um, it's really important that that driver is not self-distracting. So attention forms a big part of uh, you know, driving safely. 
And then memory, again, alluding back to what we were saying before about the advice, can they remember where it was they were going on that journey? You know, so many drivers, unfortunately, with dementia, um, will go out and perhaps get confused about where it was they were going in the first place and how to get there. So it's important that, you know, memory is key to being able to perform a journey safely and planning the journey. So planning ahead. If you see traffic slowing down on the motor, for example, are you braking in enough time so that you don't suddenly get there and have to stop because unexpectedly there's a big queue of traffic? So planning, very important. And then what we call executive function, which is bringing all of these things together. That's the ability to draw all of those skills together. And if that's not there, you might have you know, the elements of skills. But if you can't draw them together, then it could lead to an unsafe drive. And then the final one is the speed of processing. So again, when drivers are going down the road at the speed limit, and bearing in mind that could be anything from a 20 mile an hour limit right up to a 70 mile an hour um, motorway or a fast dual carriageway, can that driver drive at an appropriate speed with all the information that's being flung at them? If you're driving down a road at 70 miles an hour, there's an awful lot that is passing you at you know, very fast speeds. If a car is broken down, for example, and you're doing 70, it's going to come up at you very fast. So can that driver process uh, the information that is around them at the appropriate speed? So often we will see drivers uh, in, a, in a 40 or 50 miles an hour and they're slowing down to 30 to 35. And their reason for that being they're slowing down to be safe. But unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily follow that a slow drive is a safe drive, unfortunately, because there are other drivers on the road that you need to think about. So again, if somebody thinks it's uh, safer to drive at 40 miles an hour on a 70 limit motorway, it's going to catch other drivers out because it's unexpected. So it's really important that people's cognition is keeping up with the speed of driving. So following the on-road drive then, uh, we have the post-drive consultation. And again, a little bit like June was mentioning, um, we have a discussion of what happened in the car. So we will sit the driver down and say, okay, how do you think that went? Do you remember any errors that happened? How did you deal with those? Can you remember the advice you were given? That type of thing. And again, this is still part of the assessment, although the decision is largely made by this point. Um, so we will then make recommendations. And again, we have outcomes that vary, again, like June's ones. There could be the safe outcome, which is the best for everybody. That's fine. We will say you're absolutely safe. Do carry on. Um, you know, good luck with your future driving. There may be, um, unfortunately, the unsafe outcome. And at this point, if somebody is unsafe, we will say to them, you need to stop driving with immediate effect. There's no um, you know, sort of halfway house. You do need to stop if we tell you, because um, this means a medical professional, the occupational therapist, is telling that driver to stop. So by law, they must at that point stop driving. But there could be the, the in-between. And again, we see this a lot with our police clients, bearing in mind, as I say, often they don't have a diagnosed medical condition. Um, but it, we will say, you need to go away and have some driving lessons. You've got some bad habits, which we don't believe linked to your medical condition or lack of medical condition um, but we do think that your driving is not safe at the moment but it could be so go away and have a series of lessons and then come back and see us within three months and there's no further charge for the review assessment it's to come back and show us that uh, you know you have improved and you're safe to continue and then sometimes, even if someone is safe, there may be a condition such as dementia that sadly is not going to get any better. And, and you know, as many of you probably sadly know, it, it only gets worse. So we might say, OK, your driving today is safe, but we do think it's a good idea to come back for a checkup in six months or a year, that type of thing. So we would um, just you know, recommend to come back and uh, sorry, I forgot to click there. Um, recommend to come back after that uh, period of time. So following the delivery of the outcome, then within 10 working days, we write a full written report. And this does stretch to several pages. It's a very detailed report and it includes the findings of the cognitive testing that we mentioned earlier um, and everything that happened on the drive, including scores for the manoeuvres. And where that report goes depending or depends on the route the client came to us. So it might be sent direct to the client if they self-referred um, or it will be sent 
sent to the DVLA if the DVLA referred that client. Um, and also in some cases, a health professional might have a vested interest and the client might wish us to send the report to their GP. Um, and in the case of Hampshire Police, they also get a copy if they were the ones who initially referred that client to us. So there's a number of different places where the report goes. So if the result is unsafe, um, and it's a DVLA client, then um, DVLA will be the ones. We don't revoke licenses, as Graham says. Uh, we don't do that. Only the DVLA can do that. But it is highly likely that that will be the outcome. And usually they will hear within three or four weeks from the DVLA whether their license is going to be taken away. And with the self-referred clients, we put the onus very firmly on them. We don't send that report to the DVLA, but we do give them a copy and say you will need to forward this to the DVLA. And we expect them to do that um, only in the case if we have serious concerns that won't happen. Would we con contact the DVLA ourselves? Generally, it's over to the client. And when they assimilate the information, generally they, they do come to the understanding that they ought to send that report off. But in some cases, of course, it could be beneficial to send the report to the DVLA if it's a safe report and the DVLA are making medical investigations into a notifiable condition the client can have that report say look I've had an assessment and I am, I am safe and the DVLA do listen to that okay so I mentioned there that the checkup assessment for some medical conditions and then we do give post drive support like uh, again with June's assessments, we will try and assist that driver, especially if they have been told to stop driving with alternative methods. We've got a very good website called goingcarfree.com and it's very helpful with all manner of things such as planning journeys on public transport or going to social clubs. There's a lot of information. It's not just about stopping driving. It's a lot of things about tackling loneliness, getting about continuing the social life it doesn't all have to stop just because the driving stops and we're very keen to tell people that so we will try and help wherever we possibly can okay so that's the end of my presentation but Rob has a short video that he'd like to show you uh, it was filmed in our centre but it gives you a little idea a bit more visually about exactly what happens on the assessment so I shall stop sharing my screen and hand you back over to Rob thank you very much well, thank you, Rachel, for that uh, very informative talk about uh, driving mobility centres. I will, as promised, share my screen on this. So just let me set it up first in the first place. Um, here we go. Just need to. One second. OK. Let's just play that for you. Driving in older age can be vital to our independence. However, medical conditions and age-related issues may impact on our safety and comfort. Specialist assessment centres can assist with identifying these difficulties and help to find a solution. Wessex Drivability is one of 17 driving mobility centres throughout the United Kingdom that assist people to return to driving or review their fitness to drive. Typical clients may include someone recovering from a stroke, an older person experiencing memory problems or physical difficulties with driving. Mobility centres also offer a confidential telephone information service where assistance will be given by answering any questions you may have in relation to driving. Arriving. It's recommended that you're accompanied to the assessment centre. This can minimise fatigue travelling to your appointment and provide support throughout the assessment. When you arrive at the centre, you'll be greeted by a member of staff and offered refreshments and will be asked to complete a consent form. Assessments usually take two to two and a half hours. Done. Okay. Is that all ready? Yes, um, that all looks Brilliant. fine. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Okay, they'll be out in about five, ten minutes to come and collect you. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Pre drive assessment. You'll have an initial consultation with a driving advisor and or an occupational therapist, which will take approximately 45 minutes. 
you may wish to have your family member or friend with you during this time. My name's Gareth um, and my background is uh, as a specialist driving instructor and we're with Anna who I think you've met Hello. already today and Anna's background is in occupational therapy. Well, we'll talk about your driving history and your medical yeah. background and the possible yeah. impact of any medical conditions that you've got on driving. The assessment team will talk through any medical issues in relation to driving, check your license details and discuss what difficulties you may be experiencing with your driving. Um, in the last couple of years I found night driving is getting difficult because of glare, but I still do drive at night. Some simple physical checks will be carried out. You may be asked to complete a reaction time test. What I want you to do is to move your foot as quickly as possible from one pedal to the other. That's it, lovely. And exercises that look at memory, concentration, and visual perception. Okay, well, that'll be that one because that's a one way coming out. That one's a crossroad. It seems like you're all finished there, Kit. Well done, you've done a great job. There'll then be a short break prior to going out in a vehicle. In car assessment. So we're just going to read the number plate now, Kit. If you want to come and stand next to me over by the hedge here. You'll be asked to read a number plate at a minimum distance of 20 metres. In the vehicle, you'll be accompanied by a driving advisor and occupational therapist. All assessments are completed in a centre vehicle, fitted with a dual brake. Yeah, lovely. That's great. So as you come up to the end here, just follow round to the right. You'll be given time to adjust to driving the assessment vehicle, having the opportunity to drive in a quiet area prior to going out onto the main roads. How are you feeling with the car now? We've driven up and down a couple of times, Kit. Oh, it feels fine. Um, seat's in the right place. Anything you're not sure about with the car and the controls, or are you happy with everything no, it, here? it all seems to be OK, thanks. Good. A set route is driven on various types of road. Have you spotted the speed signs on the road here? There was a repeater on a lamppost. Yep. Absolutely, that's great. Now, once we get underneath this double bridge here, Kit, all I want you to do is pull up on the left-hand side, just by the black telegraph pole, or lamppost, sorry, here on the left-hand side. Unlike a learner driver test, you'll have the opportunity to stop and discuss any driving issues identified by the assessor, and you'll be given advice as to how to improve on these. The main thing I'm going to sort of mention, really, would be those side mirrors. Yeah. I mentioned it just once as we were coming down there. Debrief. When you return to the centre, the assessors will review your drive and discuss the outcome. With regard to the, the, the taking your time and pulling out the junctions, not a great problem for us. Um, we noticed a few occasions where perhaps you could have gone a little bit earlier and that would have perhaps kept the flow of traffic moving, yeah. but it wasn't a, a greatly significant um, issue yeah. there. If driving issues have not been resolved whilst on the assessment, it may be appropriate to offer further tuition. However, it may be that the issues demonstrated are of such a road safety risk that it's not appropriate to continue to drive or return to driving. In these instances, information regarding managing to get out and about without a car will be provided. However, our aim where possible is to keep people driving safer for longer, and when appropriate, individuals are recommended to continue to drive. Literature supporting this is provided at the end of the assessment and a report is sent out to yourself and relevant individuals. If you'd like to attend a driving mobility centre, you can contact your local centre for this to be arranged. To find your closest centre, you can visit the Driving Mobility website. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think you found that video hopefully just uh, highlighted everything that Rachel had said. We're now going to have our question and answer session. So what I'll ask is if our panel could turn their videos back on for me again. That would be fantastic. Lovely. I think Rachel's probably going to keep hers off her flickering, but we just have her voice. So uh, we'll probably keep with uh, Rachel without her video. Um, so I've got a few questions that have come in for everybody. So first thing I think is a common question that we had was costs, really, at the end of the day. I know, Graham, you touched on it. What are the sort of average costs for driving appraisals? Uh, 
Yeah, um, it varies. It does vary. Um, if you go to a an individual driving instructor, normally they the ones that their main job is to teach the learners. They're very good, um, and they can charge anything from. I think the very minimum these days is probably is about twenty pounds an hour, but many charge twenty five, thirty, or maybe even more if it's an automatic car, for example. Um, and you saw from what I said, there's a wide range of costs on the different schemes. Yes, I think they kind of vary from about that, sometimes up to £100, sometimes depending where you go across the country. And really, like I've said before, if you want to know what's in your area, visit our website, olderdriversforum.com, visit the courses page, and then uh, locate yourself the various areas that you live in. And hopefully that will give you an input on that. But um, just one thing, um, I'll ask uh, Rachel the same sort of question, really, because I know Rachel, people can voluntarily send themselves to a driving mobility centre. They don't have to be sent directly. And, and what is the cost really for mobility centres for a, a self-referral? Yes, that's right, Rob. Um, if the DVLA refer a client or motability refer a client, then that, that is free. The assessment is free completely. Uh, however, the self-referral route, it does vary from centre to centre a bit, as Graham said. We all operate as independent businesses, despite the fact we're all under the umbrella of driving mobility. For ourselves, as a um, yeah, ballpark idea, ourselves at Wessex, we're currently charging £115 for the driving assessment. However, if somebody comes back for a review after three months, if we've recommended lessons, that's free. And if they subsequently come back for a checkup assessment, then we charge that at half price. So that's a, a rough idea of what we charge. Charge. Some centres are a little more and some centres are a little cheaper, but that's a ballpark figure. Thank you. Um, and also really a question for um, Graham and June, really. If I take an assessment and it's positive, would my insurance company reduce my premiums, do you know? June, do you want to? Yeah, I'm t this is a real one of my bugbears, actually. Um, because we used to work a lot with younger drivers and trying to get them to take uh, um, further training after they'd passed their driving test on the promise or, you know, proviso that they would get cheaper car insurance. And there was very few companies offering it. And if they did offer it, it was generally the more expensive ones. And we've had lots of debate with insurance companies about this and they're not really moving on it and we've had exactly the same with our mature driver assessment but I would say you know if you do it send your your form in um, you know if it's positive to them because I don't know what difference it would make but it's a shame they're not sort of advertising that they will give a reduction if you've if you've done this, but it, it's a conversation that wants picking up again with perhaps Rob and the Older Drivers Forum. Yes, so uh, we have in the Older Drivers Forum, I do sit on the National Older Drivers Task Force, and it is one thing that we're trying to work with insurance companies to try and uh, get discounted insurance. The, the issue we have is sometimes because the some of the appraisals and assessments vary across the country, mm -hmm. they are of the concern that they would want a standardised uh, assessment, which is something that we're looking at for the future. You know, the likes of um, um, Graham's and June's appraisals are absolutely exactly the sort of ones which would be we would want everybody to be applying for and doing but not all cases uh, it's the same across the country and not all providers provide the same so what we are going to do is be looking at a standardized system once we've got that and got the right people training you the right requirements in there then the insurance companies are quite open for us to come back to them again and said you know, if people undertake an approved one, an accredited one, they're more likely to issue a, a discount on insurance. So I think there's futures ahead there. But definitely, I think the most important thing is, and I'll read a comment which got sent to me before we did this. It says, I have been on two driving courses run by Bucks County Council, run for the over 70s. The first was two years ago, and the last one was in April 2021. These courses are well worth going on. You use your own car, plan your own route, and as long, it's, uh, as long as it includes major and minor roads and maybe a little bit of motorway. The course lasts about an hour. If you decide to go on a course, you will enjoy it. 
<laughs> says, I am 81, a retired LGV class one driver, and my average yearly driving is between 10 and 15,000 miles a year. So that really just shows you it's not just about can I get a discount on my insurance? It's actually about I'm making myself safer on the road because you're brushing up on those bad habits. Graham, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, just a very quick one, Rob, is uh, with, with the best will in the world, however good the assessment is, what you're trying to do in many cases is change the habit of a lifetime in the way people drive. And that doesn't happen in that hour. It, it goes a long way to do it, but it does require the person to, to carry on with that and work on that. Um, so insurance companies recognize, I think they used to, I think they still do. If somebody has gone to that degree of passing an, an advanced test, either through IAM or Rossport or whatever, um, they, they may recognize uh, in, in a discount on the insurance because they recognize that somebody's carried on and followed that habit through improved it after a lot of training. Yes, yes. Well, thank you. Um, so uh, another one, a lot of people are obviously interested in taking up appraisals. Um, so how would someone apply for one of these? Um, I'll maybe go to June first and then over to Graham. Yeah, on the Buckinghamshire one, they can apply online um, and that's at www.buckinghamshire.gov.uk and then you have to do in the search bar um, for older drivers and then the page will come up with supporting older drivers and there's information there um, how to apply online or how to download an application form. And if all that fails, I will say, just drop me an email or give me a phone call um, and I can help you through it. Graham. Yeah, um, we have an online application form on our website um, where you can also pay for the assessment. Um, but also if you contact us by email or, or phone up, we have a, I have a standard email that I send out, they just fill in the details and then we'll line them up with an assessor. So that's great. So just to remind people, all those details are actually on our Older Drivers Forum website. So if you go on to the page called Courses, locate the area where you want, you'll find the Buck Scheme under the Thames Valley Scheme, you'll find the Hampshire one under the Hampshire Schemes there. And you'll have all those contact details for Graham and uh, also for June as well. And obviously there's a link there to driving mobility centres as well. So allow you to be able to apply for assessment with one of them as well. Um, OK, let's have a look at some of these other questions. Rachel, would it be appropriate to book an assessment purely for curio curiosity and hoping to keep ahead before feeling of any driving difficulties? Yes, um, what Graham mentioned earlier, we do have a good working relationship with them. If we had a driver who simply wanted to have their driving assessed, but with no worries about a medical condition, we would signpost them to the Hampshire 60 plus scheme or you know, other dri driving mobility centres would signpost to their local authority. They can, if, if they really insist, we would assess someone if they really wanted to come to us. But generally speaking, we would say not necessary unless there's a medical condition involved. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And also, Rachel, we saw in the video the centre vehicles were all sign written on. Is that a common theme or are most cars un, unsign written? No, we've actually decided to take the signs off our vehicles. Um, simply, you know, it can be a little bit uh, embarrassing for a driver, perhaps, if they're driving around and they're spotted by their neighbour and they didn't want people to know they were having the driving assessment. So all our fitness to drive vehicles are unbranded. They look like any other car on the road, but we still do have a couple of vehicles with the adaptations that, that, that carry our logo. And is that pretty similar across driving mobility, do you know? I think it varies from centre to centre. It's a policy that we've decided to take at Wessex, but some centres I do believe have branded vehicles. OK, and just another one. Have uh, you ever considered, and this may be open to all of you, really, have you ever considered using driving simulators as part of an assessment? Uh, shall I start with that one? Then? OK, yep, go um, for it. We, we've used a driving simulator for the younger drivers as a, I've got to be careful, but as a toy, really, because it, it is totally different from the normal driving uh, experience. It's like playing a computer game, but it has its uses. There are driving simulators available. Uh, I think Transport Research Laboratory quite possibly have one which are uh, excellent, but they're very expensive. 
So I would love to have a really good one, but we simply haven't got access to one. So that would be my answer. Okay. I, th I think they're a, a really good thing. And a research um, recently has shown that for older drivers who may be losing their hazard perception skills, actually practicing hazard perception, either through online videos or these sort of simulators um, can actually really benefit. They can you know, improve their skills by doing this. But exactly as um, Graham was saying, you know, we can't afford these sort of simulators. We do, we do use VR, but, um, and we've recently been speaking to a company about putting um, hazard perception videos on particularly for older drivers. So we, we're sort of, we'll wait and see how that goes. It's an interesting concept though. And when we talk about VR, we're talking about virtual, virtual reality. Virtual reality, yeah. yeah. The no headsets problem. that are fully immersive. Lovely. And Rachel, is there anything the driving mobility do you know up to with this? Uh, no, likewise, exactly as June and Graham have said, uh, they're large and they're expensive. So to my knowledge, no driving mobility centre has branched out into the technology as yet. Um, between us, we use a variety of other technologies, though you saw our very simple test about te testing reaction times. So it's a sort of computer based programme that we use. Other centres have a slightly larger piece of kit called a static rig. And that's a little bit like a halfway house between what we do and and the full driving simulator so the driver will sit in a car seat with a steering wheel in front of them but they don't watch a video of hazard perception there's a series of lights which will flash and as the car driver sees the light they need to hit the uh, the brake pedal for example so it uh, tests both their peripheral vision and their reaction times okay lovely and just to let you know i sit on the national task force and with that i actually hear about the funding that's going on for various projects from department for transport and in fact i know they're actually funding a project at the moment on using simulators uh, just to check on medical conditions and how they may affect this was all going to be happening and they were, had a couple of test simulators to go into doctor surgeries across the country but unfortunately due to covid and people not being able to see their doctors obviously that stopped um, it's something they have been trialing in shopping centre. They've rented a shop and they actually had one and they had people come in. It's something I think is being looked at, developed. It obviously was would only be an indicator. It wouldn't be replacing a proper assessment. It would just be one to identify initial pathways that people should be sent to the, whether or just a basic appraisal or full-blown assessment. So I think that's probably the future. It's never going to replace a proper assessment. Um, OK, if we looked at it, if someone is deemed, uh, let's get that uh, on. What happens if the observer decides that the driver is not fit for driving, but the driver disagrees? What would you get from that? And maybe if we start with Graham in this. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, uh, this happens sometimes um, because, you know, driving is one of those odd things and we... We all believe we're, we're, we're good drivers. And so very occasionally you say to someone that actually you're not as good as you thought you were. There's these issues, there's risks, and they totally disagree with you. They've, they come up with reasons, but that's human nature. We would never get into an argument with, about that. We would just try and give some examples of where they may be at risk. Um, but ultimately, if they continue to agree disagree we issue a report with our recommendations that's all written down um and we would expect them to um you know that's why they came to us so obviously if it's a risk which is endangering the public other things may happen but um normally it's just we issue a report with our recommendations and they have the information okay june anything from yourself to top up on that or rachel yeah i wouldn't say we have you know, we, we don't get many where they disagree. Generally, they know. But if we did get one that disagreed, we did have one chap a few years ago and he wanted a second opinion through, through one of our assessors. And our assessors are all sort of, you know, they're very much on the same line. So we wouldn't go down that route because it's sort of saying, oh, that's a, a, a better assessor or whatever. So we do refer those sort of ones perhaps to go for a second, if they want a second opinion to the mobility center. But I would say it is so rare 
that um, you know it doesn't come up very often. Mostly people know, as I would say, they're not generally surprised. It's you know just confirming their own thoughts. But um, no, we wouldn't give them a second opinion within our organisation. We'd send them to yeah Mobility Centre, Rosper, IAM or somebody else for that but it's written in our report exactly what our recommendations are be that i mean stop driving yeah that's a really good point you reminded me june is that we'd always look into what what the complaint was and if it was something justified where the assessor had been unfair and put them under undue stress for example then we would look into that talk to the assessor find out their point of view and I have in the past gone out and done a second opinion when they've complained about the results. Uh, okay. Normally, I will back up the assessor after yeah. that, but not always. Rachel, uh, I should imagine sometimes this can be a common problem with yourself at mobility centres, because obviously this can be sometimes the time to when someone's finding out if they're no longer safe to drive. Yeah, this is it. It's very difficult sometimes for our drivers. As June says, we don't actually get a lot that disagree because yeah, they do know and quite often they've been um, asked to come along by a family member or a GP. So they do often know that maybe they're not safe, but they're, they're hoping on the day that things will be different. Um, but as Graham says, yes, sometimes second nature is for people to disagree. So I, I, you know, I agree with both June and, and uh, Graham, but our assessors are highly trained and we are linking to a medical condition. So we don't tend to change our minds, put it that way, it would undermine our assessment yeah. process. Um, yet yeah, the client is quite within their rights to disagree with us, but we don't change reports or outcomes just because the client says they, they don't like it because road safety is ultimately what we're looking at here. Sometimes with the police clients again because there isn't a medical condition necessarily linked we will give them a little bit more of the benefit of the doubt to go and have the lesson so we will say you're not safe um, don't continue to drive independently at this point but do go and have some lessons so we're more likely to give the benefit of the doubt in case of disagreement with somebody with no medical condition okay lovely and i think it's really important to bear in mind that this isn't a reason for thinking well actually they may say I'm not safe so I should I'm not going to do an appraisal the most important thing all of us have to understand is that car is a lethal weapon at the end of the day if we're not fit to drive it then we shouldn't be on the road whether it's our independence or not and I would really say that vast majority of people who undertake appraisals and assessments have a safe outcome and it's a great way of brushing up on your skills and getting rid of those bad habits which will and will I stress allow you to carry on driving safely for longer? But if you become complacent, stick your head in the sand and say, I've driven for 50,000 years, I'm the best driver in the world. I mean, ex police officers, I'm an ex police officer, I'm in a class one for bikes and cars. Am I still one? No, I'm not, because that's what I was when I was a policeman. I'm not that anymore, and I can't say I am. I still have some skills, but they depreciate with time. So it's one of those things just because of your previous driving experience doesn't make you an expert now. So please think about it, especially when you come in to renew your license. OK, this is a common one which we get. If someone is deemed to be a danger during the assessment, do you have the right to tell authorities? Now, I know that certainly is the case for Rachel, um, because often a lot of their referrals will come from that sign. And I know we know from June and um, also, Graham, that a lot of theirs are confidential. But are there occasions when you would have, like you've said before in your uh, in your talks, you know, extreme circumstances that you'd have to do something about it? June? I was going to say it is very, very rare. I can't think of a, an instance where we've had to um, inform. And it, it's a really, really big decision. But if somebody is terribly unsafe, Generally, we've always found that there's a family member there. There's somebody there that, you know, is the sort of catalyst for this assessment taking place. So personally, I've never had that situation. And it's a really difficult one because it is confidential. But you've got to balance that against road safety. So, you know, would I if it was a family member of mine, then I would. I'm afraid, probably report them. Um, but we are relying on family members from these people that have had appraisals um, to do the right thing and stop driving if we've told them. I, and you get a feeling for the ones that are, are going to do that. And the majority, like I say, confirmation. Okay, thank you. And I, 
I think for all of you, a, a quick question here. In any of your um, appraisals or assessments, do you expect the driver to do a commentary? Um, that, yeah, we have done before, and I know June's probably the same. But the first thing is, if they've never done a commentary before, no, certainly not. Mm -hmm. But we have drivers come to us who have done advanced driving in the past, are really interested in um, improving their concentration levels. And if you can do a commentary, just talk a little bit about what you see in the far distance, then middle distance and behind and talk about what you're thinking. That really helps concentration. So in the right circumstances, yes, but we wouldn't expect that unless they really are interested. OK, I, I would say exactly the same as Graham there, that if it's something they've done before and they want to demonstrate that skill to us, fine. But if you're doing it for the first time and you're doing an assessment that maybe feels quite stressful, it can just be too much load on the mind. You know, you, you judge each one accordingly. OK. And Rachel, what about yourself? Is it something that happens in an assessment at all? Not at all. Um, I'd agree a little bit with June there. I think um, for our drivers, especially, they've got a lot going on cognitively. We certainly yeah. wouldn't be expecting yeah. them to provide a, provide a commentary, which could actually distract them. Yeah. And anyway, what we're looking for is, is their everyday driving. If they would go down the road chatting about you know, whether a bin was being put out, then fair enough. But we wouldn't <laughs> expect that on everyday driving. So we want to see them as natural as possible. OK. So some general questions now about driving. Do you have any tips on how to deal with driver, with the driver following behind you who obviously wants to drive at a higher speed in many cases where they would be exceeding the speed limit? This seems to be a very common problem, certainly for older motorists. Space. Is there any advice on what to do in relation to that? I mean, that's a, that's a tricky one. Gene, I'm sure you can uh, have some to say on this, but... Um... Uh, it's tricky. Um, if you're if you're driving at the speed limit and not below it, and it's say as long as it's safe to do that, then there's nothing you can do if someone seems to, apparently seems to be wanting to push you on. Not always the case. And you look in your rearview mirror, people are just in the habit of following quite closely. But sometimes people get frustrated, and and the only advice you can you certainly don't speed up and drive illegally. The only advice if you're feeling stressed, because that is a major problem with road safety, stress, is, is to find a safe place to pull over. Because in my experience, and I'm happy to discuss this with anybody, in my experience, that doesn't happen very often. I drive at the speed limit, and very rarely do you get somebody trying to get past. And, um, you know, if they do, you just got to deal with it safely. But that's all I can say, really. OK. June, did you have any extra for that? Um, not too much. I'd agree with everything um, Graham said there. Maybe if they're driving very close, you maybe have to think about allowing for their stopping distance as well. So maybe just dropping back a little bit from the car in front, which can frustrate them even more. Um, and sometimes, you know, in that situation, if the driver's spending more time looking in their rear view mirror because they're anxious about it, then the safest thing is to try and find somewhere safe, get them to pull over and let them take their bad driving elsewhere. Yeah, I think you're exactly the case there. Um, so this is probably might be one for Rachel or whatever. Somebody who's suffering from a mental health problem sometimes often having to take various different drugs and things, um, but seem to be perfectly fit to drive and are perfectly being assessed or looking a bit. But the problem is they keep being questioned about their fitness to drive by various different people. What would be the best way, do you think, that they could prove to someone that they're perfectly fit to drive? Is that something you could help with, Rachel, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, certainly um, we do see a lot of DVLA referrals where someone has a mental health condition, um, schizophrenia, for example, or even anxiety. We do assess those clients, um, especially if there is medication involved. But I mean, it depends who's questioning them, of course. If it's simply a, a family member and they feel that they're safe to drive, I wouldn't say they necessarily have to have an assessment. However, if it's a GP or a medical professional, uh, it may be recommended that they do come and have an assessment and apply to us privately just to reassure everybody because medication can 
form a large part of, you know, somebody's safe driving. Some medication can cause drowsiness. Um, you know, some medication can even cause blackouts. So it depends, you know, how that's affecting their driving. And ultimately, they're responsible for knowing they're safe. So, you know, if there's any concern, by all means, book themselves in for, and I would say a medical driving assessment at a driving mobility centre because of the clinical input that we have. Okay, lovely. Um, and another one you might be up. I had an assessment following development of a right foot drop. I was advised to get an automatic car with hand controls. I received five hours tuition by a specialist AA instructor, then told I was good to go, but received no certificate. Is that usual? Um, sometimes if we think someone's medical condition, it's just a case, like we say, recommend hand controls or um, you know, a, a, just an automatic if it's the left foot that's got the drop, you know, an automatic simple as, uh, as anything can sort that out. If we don't think there's anything that means with a few lessons that they wouldn't be safe, no indication, then no, we would just give that one report saying, as long as you make these changes, go and have some lessons, we would consider you safe. But in other cases, we do ask for them to come back for a review. So it really depends what we saw safety wise on the initial assessment. If we think they can adapt uh, without issue, especially if it's a younger person, for example, with good cognition, and we feel that they will adapt, then we won't see them back. But if there's concerns, we will. Well, We've actually come to our two hour time period, so we're, we're done. Thank you ever so much to June, Graham and Rachel for their inputs today. I hope you really enjoyed today's assessment. You will at the end of the webinar receive a short feedback uh, survey. We'd love you to complete it because it tells us how we're doing and what things we can plan for the future. Also, like I said to you, there's lots on our website. You will send, you automatically be directed to the Older Drivers Forum website at the end of this. Really encourage you to actually explore the website, but have a look at the videos, have a look at the courses. A lot of you asking, where do I find the courses? Again, look at the tab which says courses and locate which county and area you come from. Got a list of all the courses available in your area. Also got lots of advice about eyesight, medical conditions. And also we've got some webinars coming up at the end of this week. So if you want to watch those, please come and have a look at them. So thank you ever so much for all your time today. Really appreciate the, the wonderful speakers we've had today. If you want to look at the rest of the webinars, we've got three coming on the rest of our week. We've still got spaces. Go and have a look at our website. So once again, I'll say thank you to everybody and goodbye.